not sure what I'm going to work on today, but you know, there's plenty to do. I might uh, sandblast some of those brackets and pieces and get them ready to paint for the transmission. I might uh, not. I might start on taking that off. We'll see here in a few minutes. You'll know what I decide to do when the video starts going. And on the alternator fiasco, I uh, contacted the guy I got this alternator from. So apparently that's the only way you can get this alternator. You know, you can't buy them like this with the rounded case and rounded top there. And I've taken, you know, these parts will interchange. Anyone that says they won't, they do. I've done it before in the past. So they do interchange. So I think uh, I looked into new bearings, new diode bridge, new brushes, and a new pulley for this alternator. And the cost of all those parts individually nowadays exceeds what I paid for this alternator. So I'm money ahead if I just take the parts out of this alternator and put them in this one. I'll probably use uh, the armature and the windings in this alternator. I'll use everything from this alternator. Other than the bearings, I'll take them out of this alternator. The pulley, which I'll take off this alternator. And the diode bridge in here, I'll take off this alternator and put in this one. Now this one's, I could check it with a ohm meter, you know, to make sure it's good. If the diode bridge is good and it looks good once I take the alternator apart, I'll uh, leave the original one in here. Um, the diode bridge, basically an alternator develops alternating current and the car runs on direct current. So the diode bridge allows current to flow one way and not the other way. So it changes the alternating current from alternating current to direct current. So generally if those diodes blow, the alternator will still charge with blown diodes, but when you turn the car off it'll discharge the battery. The current will flow backwards into the alternator and literally run the battery dead, stone dead overnight. So, and, and you can check it with an ohm meter if, if you have uh, continuity to ground you got a blown diode bridge. If you don't, you got a good diode bridge. You're easy to test. And uh, so I'll check the diodes out in it. If they're good, I'll reuse them. I can clean this part up and paint it. I can probably probably reuse these screws um, because they're, they're threaded. You can see where the thread's in. These ones are threaded all the way. Little things like that, people like these, people that are in uh, correct restorations they look at little little details like that and like this as opposed to that and that and things like that that all you know people pay attention to that kind of stuff anyway I do so I'm, that's kind of what where my goal is with the alternators I'm just going to fix this alternator using the bearings and pulley from this alternator and uh, because that's the that'll cost me less to do that than to buy the parts to rebuild this. I used to go to Madison Generator in Rochester and you know I could have got all the parts to rebuild that alternator for probably 10 bucks but they're long gone and some of these rebuilders I've called to see about parts you know I'm looking at 50 60 bucks for all the parts to rebuild this alternator when I can just rob them out of a $38 alternator. So that's it on alternators for now. Another thing was I went through my hoard at my dad's and found a starter drive that will work in this starter. It's, you know, it shows its age. It's a little beleaguered looking. A little surface, just minor surface rust on part of it there, but it is brand new. The clutch works. There's nothing wrong with it, so that'll be just fine in the starter, and I think that this might even have the parts that are missing in that new starter. Um, it does, it's right there. That's what's missing in that new starter, why that drive went too far, and this hit the, this metal part was hitting the flywheel because that was missing and they're allowing this to travel too far. The armature, the whole armature was moving out of the cone 
allowing this to travel a little further than it should. So that should take care of that. So we got uh, got some starter parts. I think I'll clean this housing up and see what the date code is on it. I think this one's date coded like 84 or 85. So if this is you know a little more period correct, I'll probably use this one and just redo it. We'll see. You know, like I say, I'll wait and and get it apart and then decide. I got you know I might test it, make sure the motor works first, and go from there. So I'm going to give the starter a try, you know, hopefully nothing blows up here. I just hooked it up to the battery. I got the this hooked to the negative. It's It doesn't matter. These motors will run positive or negative ground. They don't, they're not particular. They run the same direction. You, well, it works. It definitely works. So I think I'll probably use that starter. The drive, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but the drive is kicking out. So we got a good starter, so I'll just clean this up and maybe use a few pieces like this and this off the other starter and uh, put the new drive in it, and I think we'll be fine. So the starter and alternator are both good. The reason why I ran it positive ground was this cable wouldn't fit over the positive, it would fit over the negative, and I didn't realize that until after I put it on the starter. And this one kind of fit down on over there. You know, there's no insulation on that whatsoever, that's just bare wire. But anyway, I just, you know, just, that's how you check starters. You just, you know, take your chance and... And uh, if it does nothing, you know, you got a bad starter. I see no zero numbers on this starter motor other than on the cone there. And Tyler told me that that makes this a 67 starter. And I tend to think that that's probably the case, but we'll, uh, we'll go through it and uh, make it look pretty and work good and put it back on the car. You can see, I can see anyway the drives kind of buggered up from the flywheel and let's see how easy that spins. That's not going to catch. That that's Bendix starter drive is shot along with the strip flywheel. So yeah that shouldn't turn that easy. You shouldn't be able to flick that with your finger like that. That's a one-way clutch in there and it's designed to grab, which it does grab that way, so it can crank the engine, but if the engine starts, and this hasn't disengaged the flywheel, this is supposed to spin in that one-way clutch so it doesn't explode the windings on the armature of the starter shaft. I decided to pull the steering gear as my chore for this evening, and I just pulled the wheel cover to pull the wheel and notice one of the axle or hub studs, wheel studs is broke off, so I'll have to address that if I reuse the hub and drum. Alright, so that is uh first time I've seen this with the wheel off, and that turns enough to where I could probably break the adjusters, back them off, and get the, the hubs off. I think that these are part, you know, pressed onto these. I don't think these separate, but We'll soon find out, but these are the bolts that hold the steering gear on. So there's a plastic rivet, a bolt, plastic rivet, and a bolt for the steering gear that hold this this rubber on. So I'll get that off, and uh, you can see some of the brake lines right here. I think they actually don't look too bad. The, the brake lines are in good shape. They're all going to get replaced, but I mean, my lord, for the car sitting that still shiny silver, that brake line, I wonder if it had been replaced at one time. It's got like a sleeve over it instead of that wrapped wire stuff. Let me get a light. Well, I'm going to have to hold two, two things here, I think. But that brake line is still... They're both in really good shape. The nut there and that is kind of beat down that comes from the brake cylinder. 
But that's all going to get replaced. This has got like a, I don't know if you can see that or not. Instead of the wire wrapping around it, it's got like a second coating on it. And, uh, all right, there's the plastic rivet and whatnot. And the inside of this is really nice and solid. Just needs a little TLC, a little cleaning and painting. I'm going to take out all these plastic uh, rivets to take that. And if I take them out from this side, I can save them. I won't ruin them. So you can just push them out. All right, let me uh, get to work here. So I am going to replace these uh, fender well flaps and I took this one off and I do it so I save the clips. I'll get my pliers here and kind of show you. See how there's a little groove in it there? See, so just take your pliers and squeeze it lightly and push it through. It's just super easy to do and then you can reuse those if you know a lot of times these don't come with these or you get the reproductions and they're nothing like the originals or completely different or they're they're expensive or some usually there's some reason and I just have a bad habit of saving them so I can reuse them it's just if I if the new ones come with identical ones I'll put these in a drawer and save them for the future but you know it has thousands of them and the rubber trim that all the rubber trim on the car is held on with those things so I save as many as I can that's what they look like when they're totally out and that will make life easier to work on this kind of stuff I, I think um these are the nuts for the front doing the front end alignment you move these control arm back and forth and can turn it so I want to get those all freed up and the stuff all working before I uh, put the engine back in. And I may replace these. I noticed this one's a little off center. So I'll probably have to put upper control arm bushings in it for sure. And uh, the lowers, you know, I'm going to take the lower control arms out to put springs in. So we'll look at them, may replace some too. I mean, they're not terribly expensive and they're not that hard to change once they're off. So might as well do them. All right, I took the bolt out to get this flap thing off. Look at that, there's still paint on it there. And there and clear metal. And look at how clean and solid the frame is there. That's still black. It's a little dirty, but it's not rusty at all. So these are the bolts to hold the steering gear in. So I'll get at them next. So those bolts all loosened up with ease. So what I got to do now is pull a pitman arm and the steering column from the gear. So I'm going to take the pitman arm off first from under here. Somehow get in there and then I'm going to pull a, the steering column free from it and disconnect the power steering pump lines and get that out of there too. I don't know if that plastic rivet shows up in there or not, but I just take a screwdriver and then push the pin back out through to this side. See the, let me um, get back up here to where I can show you. I can't put the camera on the tripod here. But see how that's pushed out now? I should just be able to pull it right out now. There we go. So now I can reuse this little plastic rivet by just reinserting that in there and pushing it in when I go to reassemble it. So, and if I can get this rubber new, I'll replace it. But you can see that is nice and there's a missing rivet there I, you can st I got tons of those rivets you can still buy them but I got a whole drawer from them from cars I've parted over the years it looks like there's one two three and there's only one in there so I'll uh, I'll replace the missing one so let me get the uh, you know and I can paint all this now without you know clean this up and paint it without that rubber in there to look a lot nicer and I'm going to be taking this trim off and this trim off and 
you know, when I do the body, the emblems, every, the car will come all apart, but this will get painted assembled and the bumper's gonna come off. So this bracket will come out as these bolts hold the bumper to the chassis. I'll just take the bumper off with the brackets. I guess I should have started the camera sooner, but that's basically 90% off. I just hit it with the impact gun for a half a second and it just pulled right off. So there we go, the Pittman arm's off. Now I'm going to disconnect the bolt that holds the steering shaft to the gear. And that takes a 12 point socket. It's a 12 point head on that bolt. You got to take the bolt 100% out because it goes through a notch in the shaft. And that shaft will not separate unless that is 100% out. But you can see the bolt head there. I did notice a date code on the bottom of the steering gear, so we will check that out once we get it out of the car. This is the return line, and it looks like the nut seized on the tubing because it's just turning. So I'll just take the steering gear out with the lines attached, and then I'll deal with them once the steering gear is out. Yeah, that's going to round off that nut, so I'll probably just cut the tubing off and put a socket on it. Because I'm going to replace both, this is a high pressure, low pressure, and I'm going to replace both the lines. I'm not going to trust these lines. You saw in the Bel Air this past summer, I had a power steering line blow, so. And that one was probably only about 20, 25 years old. These ones are 53 years old. All right, so I got a unbolt the gear from outside and then I can hopefully work it out and off. So I don't want the steering gear to hit the floor so I left one bolt in, a couple of turns. It's kind of a pain to turn it without a wrench. So I guess I'm going to go get a wrench. go. Steering gear is off. So this has a tag here and that says HCE and then a big space on C3 and then it's got a 358620. It's got, uh, I'll take you off the tripod so you can see the other numbers. Just trying not to get the documenter all dirty here. It's uh, says FAMOCO and then it's got a C6AR and a 3580-A and then on the bottom of the gear date codes kind of cockeyed but it says D13 and the 6 you can just barely 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 make it out it just almost looks like they didn't even put it in right or something but it's D which would be April 13th 66 it's got a C5 AR there or a DIF there and a 6 over there and it has a I can't read that it looks like a D116 and this part on the valve so that's probably April 11th, 66, this was cast, because this is a, as you see, that's bolted on, so that's a separate casting than this. This is the leaking seal, and the shaft moves just a little bit when you turn the steering wheel. So I think there's a bushing in here that this rides in. It's like a Babbitt bushing, much like the bearings in an engine. And that's probably worn, causing that shaft. I mean, it just moves ever so slightly. I don't even know if I could move it 
with my fingers. It was so slight, but that's enough to cause those seals to leak. And you can see a snap ring. I don't know if you can see that or not, but there is a snap ring in there. So you take that snap ring out, and then you can get that. I can get these seals out without tearing the gear apart, but you can't change that bushing in there without tearing the gear apart. So I'm not going to take anything apart until I have the part. So I'm going to take the gear and go to the steering gear place. Set it on their counter and get all the pieces to it. I'm just going to leave this whole assembly together until I get there probably next week one day. In the meantime, this weekend, I'll start ripping into the brakes. Yes, I need to invest in a new pair of shoes. Better glue it. This is still, that's not my sock. That's still the base of the shoe. Maybe I can glue it. I like these shoes. These are Brooks Dyads. I had plantar fasciitis and I went to the doctor and they gave me all these uh, inserts and I hated them all and so I went and bought a really good pair of shoes and I loved them and then over the years I've when they discontinued certain brands I found these at a place where people go to you know run or jog and they are the most comfortable shoes I've ever owned I have a couple pair I think these are my old beater ones I think they're about ready for the garbage can <laughs> So anyway, here we go, back on the car, off of shoes now. So that's a little cleaner in there. That's the, the shift linkage, and I'll probably take that out, take that ground strap off. I took the accelerator cable off so I wouldn't uh, break it. I'm going to take the power brake booster off, the windshield wiper motor off. I'm going to take the cowl, windshield wiper cowl off and take all that apart so I can lubricate all that. You can see you got really good access to that now with all that apart and the engine out. So, you know, that'll be super easy to, to work on. So, these are what I got to make sure are free for the alignment. You got to take them out anyway to do the control arm bushings. And yeah, that bushing definitely needs replacing. So I'll just do all four of them and uh, all four of the top ones and then there's two on the bottom. I believe. I'll just do all the bushings, you know why it's apart. It definitely needs a bushing here. So there's no point in not changing it when it's this far apart. And I'll put springs in it because it needs springs and obviously shock absorbers. And that's the fuel line from the tank and uh, it's the OEM one it's like a plastic tubing and it actually says right on it freehold Ford and then it says uh, fuel and whatnot right on it and that's a factory original clamp so this is all the original fuel lines and I'm not going to replace that that's never going to rust out and if it doesn't leak why change it I'll probably take this off and put a new sticker here um, a little water from something on there and probably from the probably a little bit of power steering fluid so I'll get this flap off and the wiring and the starter solenoid and I might see if I can get that out of there if I can get this out because I got a the heater motor is really loud it needs to be lubricated I don't know if the fender has to come off to get to the heater motor or what but we'll deal with that when we get to it but I can start you know, I can get these things off and really start disassembling things and why these are off to put control arm bushings in them. I might as well throw them in the bead blast cabinet and paint them. Same with the lower ones. Take these and throw them in the bead blast cabinet and paint them. And clean up all everything and, you know, paint it up. I don't think I'm going to bead blast the power brake booster. I think I'll just sand it out just very carefully. I don't want to get anything in it. And, uh... This is kind of where we're at right now, so I think I'm going to call it a day. And if you like the video, hit the like button. If you want to see this car resurrected, subscribe to my channel. And thank you for watching. And just because I ended the video doesn't mean I'm not going to work on the car anymore today. Yeah, I did take the steering gear off and, you know, check the starter and stuff, but... There's a lot of stuff that, you know, isn't worth videoing, like bead blasting stuff. You know, it's just a lot of noise and 
and there's you know it's nothing really exciting about it so that's why I don't video it so that is what I'm gonna do now for the rest of the evening do this and the other components that are in the cabinet and uh, might take the fan off the alternator because that I'm probably gonna reuse them just gonna switch the pulley um, so yeah I'm just gonna get to be blasting some stuff so when I do go to paint I can paint some other components. I'll be mixing more black and paint more black so if I uh, you know when I paint the transmission if uh, you know if I have some other components to paint at the same time I'll paint them and then you know I'm gonna have to paint the steering gear and the power booster and you know other components so I'll be mixing up paint again so I'm not worried if I get everything be blasted but you know the more I get done the less will have to be done when I go to set the engine back in.